Good morning, everybody. You will be saying this guy again every morning. So uh, the good news is today I will not talk that much because we have uh, four hour, well, or we have three hours really, one and a half plus one and a half uh, shared between Dominic, who's sitting here, and me. And I think probably Dominic will speak for approximately 60% of that time. Um, but we're taking turns, so you don't get uh, too bored with any phase. So this is about causal inference. Uh, so far you only heard me talking about kernels and this kind of stuff, uh, which is what we uh, used to work on mostly here, and we still work on, but now uh, a big topic for us is causal inference, and we think it's fascinating, and there's a lot of uh, interesting open problems. So I hope we can not only give you a tutorial, but also ca convey some of this uh, excitement about this a field which is still relatively recent for us. So, um, let me start by giving you a bit of a roadmap. <coughs> so, uh, we start with an informal uh, motivation, uh, and then talk about functional causal models, uh, which is a kind of model that uh, maybe for someone with a machine learning background uh, is the best access or the best entry point into uh, causal inference. Um, we talk about graphical models, uh, but now from the causal point of view, you, you know graphical models already uh, from Chris's tutorial. Uh, Chris gave you the machine learning point of view, but uh, it's actually interesting that maybe one of the mo main people who developed graphical models today, Pearl, uh, is actually mostly uh, uh, developing these models for causal inference. So that's where, in a sense, they come from. So it's interesting uh, to think of them in from this point of view. Um, we'll talk about interventions and then uh, finally about a number of uh, methods how to do causal inference in practice. Okay, so so first let me try to motivate uh, what this is all about. So I think uh, um, we all know that, uh, or at least we have heard, uh, that there's a difference between dependence and causation. Um, and people often make the mistake of confusing the two things, uh, for instance politicians, so, for instance, in this uh, example here, which was uh, published in a funny paper in, uh, in a statistics journal uh, with the title Storks Deliver Babies, um, there's this data set of different European countries and the, uh, the birth rate uh, among the human population in these countries and uh, the occurrence of storks. And uh, one can see that there's a strong correlation between the occurrence of storks and the birth rate. Um, but nevertheless, we would not try to uh, increase the birth rate, suppose this were our goal as a politician, uh, the human birth rates by increasing the number of storks. So this is a, a typical example uh, that uh, where things could go wrong, and maybe this is a very naive example, we all notice that it doesn't make sense, because we have this background knowledge that we, we think we know how human babies are, are generated, and it has <laughs> nothing to do with storks. But, uh, but actually, this kind of error can be more subtle sometimes, and it also affects. It can also affect machine learning systems. Uh, this is a, a nice example. Um, it's a snapshot taken a while ago. It's not like this anymore. But it used to be the case that if you went to Amazon and you tried to buy this uh, rucksack, which seems to be a special laptop rucksack, then Amazon would recommend that along with the rucksack, you should also buy this laptop here. And that's. It's also. Kind of funny, maybe a little bit less than the storks. It's a little bit less naive. Um, but if you think about it, you would think, well, uh, maybe in a sense it would, if, uh, if someone were to buy a rucksack, maybe you should be recommending, to, uh, sorry, if someone were to buy a laptop, maybe you should be recommending to them that they should also get a rucksack with, the, with it. But it's unlikely that someone who specifically looks for a laptop rucksack would then afterwards want to buy a laptop. So. So there's uh, certainly in the Amazon database, there would be a statistical dependence between uh, uh, these uh, events of buying a rucksack and buying a laptop. Uh, but uh, the way we want to use dependence or the way we should be using this dependence uh, should be somehow asymmetric. Uh, of course, statistical dependence is, dependence is inherently a symmetric concept. So it's not just about dependence. There must be something more. And that's uh, what we're trying to talk about today. So intuitively, we would say that buying the laptop is in some sense causal for buying the rucksack, or should be causal, but not vice versa. And uh, I hope I managed to convince you that this is a, somehow this is a real difference between these two directions, at least intuitively. Um, so dependence causation are not the same, but there are links uh, between the two. 
But before I get to that, uh, a second example, just uh, briefly. Um, this is not extremely systematic, these examples at the beginning, it's just to get you interested, get you motivated, that you want to learn something about causality. So this was uh, a study that appeared uh, last one or two years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine about coffee drinking and uh, different uh, ways of dying uh, and uh, how coffee drinking is associated with different types of mortality. And what uh, people found was that, uh, so this is a big study, which uh, I don't know how many, uh, yeah, I don't know, like 100,000 people or something. So during the study time, 30,000 men died and 18,000 women. Uh, and they found, first of all, that the risk of death was increased among coffee drinkers. That's bad. However, they noticed that coffee drinkers were also more likely to smoke. And after they adjusted for the smoking, so they only compare people who smoke the same amount of, of cigarettes, uh, but with different amounts of coffee consumption. So you after, after you adjust for this and other potential confounders, so that's already an interesting word, confounder, um, it turned out that uh, there was an inverse association between coffee consumption and mortality. So uh, that's interesting. So if you are some random person who has never heard of coffee and now you want to decide, should I start drinking coffee or not, then uh, uh, the question is sort of which association should be the one that's relevant for you. Should you start drinking coffee or not? Uh, and this, these are all non-trivial questions. And actually, it's interesting. They also looked at all these uh, details about different ways of dying. I don't know if you can read this. Probably not. So this is... Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think this. So this vertical line is, the, is sort of the baseline, um, and if we are to the left, uh, that means coffee helps you, and if we are to the right, then coffee is bad. So coffee helps in uh, many cases. Um, it turns out it helps, uh, especially here in this. No, what was it? No, no there was uh, there was one thing that was interesting. Something about traffic accidents. <laughs> But uh, I don't find it. So somehow the message was, it doesn't actually matter much whether it's caffeinated or decaf, uh, but the caffeinated coffee protected you a little bit more from traffic accidents than the other one. So uh, anyway, so this is a little bit um, we are interpreting maybe too much, but uh, these kind of studies are trying to find out what are, in some sense, the causal effects, even though most of these studies probably wouldn't use uh, this terminology. So, for instance, here, I think the, the word causal probably doesn't occur. I oh, know, maybe down, down here. They yeah, they just say at the end, whether this was a causal or associational finding cannot be determined. So, causality is a difficult issue, and people are careful about uh, making claims. Uh, this is the last example. It's also uh, maybe even tr more tricky. So, there was this study in Germany, you don't have to read it, um, a few years ago that uh, the closer you live to a nuclear power plant, uh, the more likely it is that uh, children have uh, certain types of cancer. Uh, leukemia, I believe, yeah, leukemia. So, um, and, but the way it was discussed in the public was, it felt, I felt it was very naive. Uh, people just said, well, there's this link, it seems to be statistically significant, um, but then there's no other discussion of where this could come from. And I think most people who, read this would think, well, it's of course the, the power plants are causing this, and uh, I don't know, it's possible, I'm not, I don't want to take a side in this, uh, but it's, it's perfectly possible also that there might be other factors, other confounders, uh, for instance, there might be parents who give their children more healthy food, or maybe parents who are richer or whatever, and uh, if, if this variable, whether you like to give your children healthy food or whether you are rich, influences uh, whether you're likely to move close to a nuclear power plant, uh, that can be a strong confounder. So it's uh, very difficult to uh, make causal statements, draw causal conclusions from this kind of results. So anyway, the main message is uh, it's difficult to uh, in draw conclusions about causality just from statistical dependence. And if we just find statistical dependencies, it's one has to be careful how to interpret them. So uh, usually people don't talk about dependence, usually people talk about correlation. I think we probably know it's not quite the same. We might get to this, I think we'll get to this a little bit later. Um, 
dependence is the more general uh, term. Uh, and there's this uh, phrase that goes like, correlation does not tell us anything about causality. So let's, let's accept that, or let's even accept the stronger that dependence doesn't tell us anything about causality. Uh, but maybe this is a little bit strong. Um, first of all, for the other directions, uh, one should also say statisticians would probably agree that causality does us tell us something about dependence. But it turns out dependence does, uh, tells us something about causality as well. And this was first pointed out by uh, Reichenbach, uh, who was a, a very interesting guy, a philosopher and physicist, uh, who I think he, he started working on, he did his PhD thesis on logics uh, in philosophy, I believe. But then he moved to Berlin and became a professor in the physics department. And um, later in his life, then I think he moved to Turkey for a few years and then to uh, UCLA, where he founded an important philosophy school. Uh, he was, for instance, the PhD advisor of Hilary Putnam. Anyway, so this guy was quite broad, was thinking about all sorts of things. He wrote this book called The Direction of Time, and in this book he uh, postulates a common cause principle, um, which, not quite in this way, but we will state it like this. So it's a principle that links causality and probability, and it says that if you find two observables x and y to be statistically dependent, then there must be an observable z that causally influences both of them. And that means uh, Z could be this uh, unobserved confounder that causally influences both of them, or it could be uh, that Z coincides with either X or Y, in which case we would get one of these two situations. Um, and the main message is there is no statistical dependence without an underlying uh, causal structure. So causality is what actually generates statistical dependence, he says. And secondly, uh, he said that uh, uh, Z, uh, this uh, uh, causal variable, uh, screens X and Y from each other in the sense that uh, conditioned on Z, uh, X and Y become independent. So they don't, uh, they don't uh, exchange any information uh, that doesn't involve Z somehow. Yeah? Okay, so this is uh, quite interesting and in a sense, it's the main idea of, of graphical models, one could say, and of, of causal graphical models. Uh, but before getting to this, just one slide of notation and a few basics. <coughs> so we will use, I hope we consistently use, but we, we try to do this, and we, we, we held this tutorial once at ICML, and we just extended it a little bit, so hopefully it's, the, it's fine. Um, we use uh, uppercase uh, letters for events, if it's events, we try to use A and B, random variables, X, Y, Z. Uh, small uh, lowercase characters are values of random variables. Uh, PR, uh, we use for a probability measure. Uh, if we have the particular case of uh, a probability distribution of a random variable, so that's also a kind of probability measure, uh, but associated with a random variable, uh, then we use uh, P sub uh, X or whatever the random variable is. Uh, we use lowercase p for density. Um, I think we always assume or that there are densities for simplicity. So if you uh, don't know what the probability uh, the distribution is in general, then just think of densities. So lowercase p is a density. Uh, if we want to specifically say it's the density of the random variable x or, or, or corresponding to this distribution, we use a subscript or we put it in the parenthesis here into the argument. Um, if we specifically want to evaluate the density at one point, so this is just a number, so that's lowercase p of lowercase x. And we should say we always assume the existence of a density or a joint density if we have several var variables with respect to uh, some product measure. Okay, so now <coughs> this is just a repetition. I think probably Chris already talked about these things, but just briefly, so you see it in our notation. Uh, independence, so first of all, one defines independence for events. So these are uh, sets, or formally uh, elements of a sigma algebra, on where the probability measure is defined. Uh, just think of them as some sets, so the probability. Uh, two events are independent if the probability of the intersection uh, factorizes into these probabilities. 
Um, and of, we will, of course, we will also put these slides uh, on the web. I think they are not there yet, but uh, we'll put them later today, probably. Um, here's the definition for... So if we generalize to n events, then um, the generalization is as follows. We call them independent if for every subset of 1 through n, we have this kind of factorization. And it turns out that uh, if n is at least 3, uh, this kind of independence is not implied by a pairwise independence. Yeah. Um, so joint independence of a larger set of random variables is not quite the same as pairwise independence. It implies pairwise independence, but not strictly vice versa. So that was for events. Now, independence of random variables. So in the end, we will always be talking about random variables. So. Uh, Random variables are functions on a probability space, um, but again, if you don't know much about probability or about formal probability theory, just think of them as real-valued quantities that have a distribution <coughs> or a density. Um, so, in the general case, we call them independent and use uh, this notation here. If uh, the events that we can con construct like this, so an event of a random variable uh, being bounded uh, by, or, or of the outcome being uh, uh, not larger than A, and here the same for random variable Y and B. So if these events are independent, then we call the random variables independent. So if for every A, B, these events are independent. And we can, uh, maybe that looks a little bit less practical, that definition, but if we have densities, we can equivalently write it like this the density of x and y, the joint density, factorizes into the product of the two uh, uh, marginal densities. Okay, so a little note, and I think we're almost done with the uh, preliminaries. Um, if uh, x is independent of y, then uh, it turns out that the expectation of x and y factorizes into the, uh, the individual expectations. Um, and for the, and the covariance uh, for which we have this simple formula that you probably know, uh, in this case, so if this is equal to this, the covariance becomes zero. So for independent variables, the covariance is zero. The converse is not true. So, so if the covariance is zero, the variables don't have to be independent. Uh, however, uh, there's a nice statement. We'll come to back to, to that. Uh, come back to that later. Um, if we require, so first of all, if x and y are independent, then not just the covariance between x and y is zero, but also uh, the, the, the covariance between functions of x and functions of y is zero. Now that's a stronger statement, but somehow if x, are, if x and y are independent, we cannot generate any, any covariance or any dependence by applying functions, deterministic functions to them. Well, vice versa, I said covariance being zero does not imply independence. But it turns out if we uh, require something stricter, that the covariance uh, is not just zero like this, but also zero if we allow for uh, uh, transformations of x and y. So if we require that this is true for a sufficiently large set of functions, then it turns out this implies independence. So then we have the implication in both ways that we have equivalence. So we'll, we'll get back to that later. That will be important in the context of kernel-based uh, independence measures. But now the main message is uh, independence is stronger than uh, uh, covariance zero. So next there's this uh, notion of conditional independence. And uh, so conditional independence is written like this. We have two random variables uh, and a third one on which we are conditioning. Uh, conditional independence is sometimes expressed like this. Sometimes we leave out these uh, parentheses, write it like this. Sometimes we, we put the uh, p down here to uh, imply that this is uh, with respect to a product measure p, uh, which is a, a function of x, uh, sorry, a joint, sorry, a joint measure p, which is a function of x, y, z. So p of x, y, and z is exactly not a product measure, a joint measure. Um, and um, so this is our notation because sometimes we put a different subscript here if we talk about independences imp uh, implied by the graph. <coughs> but if there's no subscript, it's all with respect, with respect to the joint measure. And uh, conditional independence is equivalent in the existence of densities 
So I don't give you the, the complicated formal case now, just the one with densities, um, to this factorization. So this conditional distribution of x and y is the product of these two conditionals. Um, yeah, and there's a little subtlety here, but let's not talk about this now. Um, <coughs> I think you remember from Chris's course that conditional independence is uh, very different from independence. It doesn't imply independence, and it's not implied by independence. So we can always cons construct cases where uh, one is the case and the other one is not. <coughs> okay, so that's uh, the preliminaries or prerequisites. Um, and uh, now we get to the <coughs> uh, causal graphical models or functional causal models. Um, and this is a field that was developed uh, to a significant extent by Judea Pearl, whom you see in a picture here. Uh, he was on the uh, title page of this journal because he received the Turing Award last year. Um, but there's also a number of other people who have contributed to this field, and maybe we'll see some of the names popping up on the next slides, uh, like the uh, group of philosophers from Carnegie Mellon University, uh, uh, Spurtus, uh, uh, Glymore, uh, and uh, Shines, uh, as well as uh, some mathematicians uh, such as uh, Stefan Lauritsen. Yeah. Uh, Danish statistician uh, working in Oxford. Um, so anyway, it's not a historical perspective, it's uh, about conveying some ideas. And uh, here, so the idea is we have a set of observables, um, x1 through xn. We uh, assume that these observables for form a directed acyclic graph with g. And uh, this graph contains the causal relationships in the sense that uh, we will think of parents in the graph as direct causes of their children. So right now, so so far the graph has uh, uh, nothing to do with uh, the uh, with probability. Uh, it just encodes the the causal structure. Um, and now probability enters the game uh, by inserting noise essentially. Uh, so we will assume that each node is a function, a deterministic function. Uh, of its parents and a noise variable. So at, at each node, uh, we have the inputs coming from the parents, plus, or in, in, in addition, we have one input which is a noise variable. So if you want, you can think of this noise variable coming from the side here. Uh, the functions are deterministic, but since the noise will be random, uh, the whole thing will uh, behave randomly. And uh, uh, cr the crucial assumption now is that all these noise variables, so at each node we have one noise variables, uh, we assume that all of them are jointly independent. So it turns out this is a strong assumption, and that's in a sense what makes causal inference possible. Um, or if, if you don't have this assumption, you get significantly harder, let's put it this way. Um, and. Uh, Yes, yeah. So let's think uh, briefly about what is it, uh, a noise variable. So uh, a Perl usually uses the notation u for these noise variables, uh, which is a shorthand for unexplained. So it doesn't, it's not, you shouldn't imagine that there's a, uh, some uh, uh, fundamental noise that someone uh, is observing an, an atom of something uh, and, and waits until it decays to give you a true noise. But it's just a variable that we haven't uh, modeled uh, in, or that's not in our causal system that we're considering. Something that comes from outside, <coughs> and that's independent of each other. So these different noise variables are independent. Um, this independence is an important assumption, as you will see. Um, I also want to say at this point already, one could make even stronger independence assumptions that are qualitatively a little bit different and that help uh, in causal inference. Uh, we will get back to that later. Uh, namely, one could uh, require that in some sense to be specified, uh, not just the noises are independent, uh, but also these functions are independent. So, so we'll get, uh, get to this in various guises uh, later on. <coughs> okay, so it, uh, before I tell you what this model implies or what properties it has, um, I first want to tell you that it satisfies uh, the Reichenbach principle. So now we have, uh, so Reichenbach was saying, uh, if we, <coughs> if we, or maybe I'll just remind you, if we see two observables and they are statistically dependent, uh, then there must be a third one that 
causally influences both of them. And also uh, conditioning on that uh, removes the dependence. So now suppose we have such a network of variables in a graph with, with these noise variables uh, at every node. And now we observe two of these variables uh, and all the uh, um, distributions, etc., were generated. Uh, from these noise. Now, you, if you imagine you put in these independent noise distributions and it's a direct acyclic graph, then there's a, an, an order in which you can compute uh, these functions. And then, since this is random, all these things become random variables. So all the x's will be random variables and they will have some joint distribution. And then you can ask, uh, if I now pick out two of them, will they satisfy the Reichenbach principle? <coughs> and this is the case. Um, Maybe just briefly, the uh, reason why this is the case is that if you take independent variables, so the noise variables are independent, uh, then if you compute functions of them, uh, they're still independent. Uh, you cannot generate dependencies by uh, deterministic functions. Uh, therefore, uh, if you do see dependence, for instance, between x and y here, then this kind of dependence can only uh, arise uh, because these two vertices uh, at least partly depend on the same noise terms. So if these two guys were depending only on different noise variables, uh, then no dependence could be generated. So there must be some uh, joint noise variable somewhere uh, up, up the line here that must be connected to both of them. And uh, of course, if we then condition on this uh, noise term, or it could be several noise terms, then the variables become independent. So that's the one thing I wanted to say. The other thing is uh, about this independence of noise. Um, one can interpret this, or, or people sometimes call this uh, uh, a form of, of what, they, what they call causal sufficiency. Uh, imagine if we had two noise variables in such a uh, causal structure equation model. If we had two noise variables that were dependent, then we could apply Reichenbach's principle. Reichenbach tells us if we find two variables that are dependent, then actually there's a confounder that influences both of them. So from that point of view, if two of these noise variables to these guys were dependent, then we would say actually the graph is not big enough. We have to draw another node that actually causally influences both of them. And then that node again would have its own noise term. And then hopefully that noise term and all the other noise terms would be jointly independent. Okay, so so much for the motivation of this. Um, and uh <coughs> I also briefly wanted to say, and I think we'll come back to this also several times, uh, about interventions. So if we want to intervene in such a model, so causality is a lot about interventions, uh, trying to predict what will happen if I set a certain variable to a certain value. Um, interventions are very easy to, to understand or to do in such a, uh, such a model. So this model, uh, I think I've used the term already, it's sometimes called a, a structural equation model. So in a structural equation model, um, we just have to replace, uh, if we want to intervene on this variable xi, <coughs> we just have to set the variable, uh, um, sort of we, we cut off the function, or, or we just set it to something, and then it will feed into these uh, other ones with that value. <coughs> okay, so I've already said that if we have these noise variables that have uh, distributions of so the noise variables are, uh, random, they have some distributions that uh, factorize, um, they're independent. We feed in these distributions, then uh, we can use all these deterministic functions to uh, uniquely uh, compute the dis joint distribution of our uh, observed random variables. Um, so we get some joint distribution. <coughs> and the question now is, uh, what kind of properties does this joint distribution have? And in particular, a question that people have thought about a lot is, uh, given the joint distribution, can we recover the graph? So if we only have observations, possibly infinitely many, so enough that we can perfectly recover the distribution, does that tell us something about the graph? So that does it tell us what is causing what? So that's in some sense the holy grail of, of causal inference. Um, and it turns out, First of all, one can, one can say a lot about this distribution. So that was the first question. What properties does it have? This has been studied in great detail. And there's a number of equivalent conditions subject to some condition, uh, technicalities. Uh, and they are the following. First is the existence of a functional causal model. That's what I showed you so far. 
Uh, second thing is uh, so-called the, the local causal Markov condition, which you, I think you know from uh, uh, Chris's talk, but let me just briefly repeat. So the local causal Markov condition, which you can also think of as a, a, a generalization of Reichenbach, says that um, xj, this, this variable here, for any j is statistically independent of its non-descendants given its parents. So the parents are the ones feeding in, so the, the red ones are its parents. So if we know the parents, if we condition on the parents, then xj is independent of its non-descendants. So these are the descendants, these are the parents, and the non-descendants is, is all the rest. <coughs> and one can also interpret this uh, uh, in terms of information flow. So this means that every information exchange uh, between the variable and its uh, non uh, sorry and its non descendants has to involve the parents and in fact <coughs> thinking of things in terms of information theory i, I find very useful or in, or in terms of communication uh, uh, all the information actually is uh, fed into the system from the noise variables and then um, it turns out you can <coughs> find out about the structure of this graph by kind of tracking how this information goes through the network uh, and who knows information about what, uh, even when conditioned on something. So do I know more information about this variable uh, than if I only have this one, etc. So in principle, one can also think of things this way. Anyway, so that's the local uh, causal Markov condition. And uh, then there's also a global causal Markov condition, which uh, you in principle also know in terms of uh, deseparation. So Chris told you about deseparation, and I think uh, you will say a little bit more about it later on because Dominic is going to uh, provide proof sketches for these uh, different connections here. Um, so it turns out that uh, uh, these local uh, independencies, they are true, but they actually imply a set of uh, more, more global independence, conditional independence properties. Uh, if you have those, you automatically get a larger class. And uh, this is uh, characterized in terms of this notion deseparation, which we will uh, repeat. Um, so this is a special case of this, but actually uh, uh, it, it turns out to imply it. And then finally, the last equivalent condition is a factorization of the joint distribution. <coughs> and remember, Chris was uh, also working with these kind of factorizations. and. Uh, yeah, the the non-trivial thing or, uh, or non-trivial statement here in this factorization is that uh, we can write the joint distribution as a product of uh, conditionals where uh, there's one conditional for each node and we only have to condition on the parents of that node. So all these things are equivalent, uh, where I should say that uh, I didn't say that there's a unique causal functional causal model. There's, there's many of them, but uh, whenever one of these other conditions is true, you can prove that there is one which generates this joint distribution. Okay, so now uh, gradually moving to the part where Dominic will take over, but maybe um, a tiny little bit of philosophy because uh, this is uh, uh, it's a minefield causality and I, I don't want to get into discussion about philosophical issues but maybe uh, you should know a little bit about it uh, uh, because these terms come up uh, in the literature so uh, there's this notion of a counterfactual and i think we will not talk much about it but at least you should hear a little bit what it's about and this uh, maybe first came up here or at least people like to quote david hume for this so Hume said, uh, we may define a cause to be an object followed by another and where all the objects similar to the first are followed by objects similar to the second. So this is so far, it's uh, maybe easy to understand and in some sense one could even say that's uh, encoded in such a structural equation model if the functions are relatively smooth. But now he says something uh, and he says in other words, so it's supposed to be something similar and I don't, I don't see why it's the same. To me it sounds quite different, but Maybe he had a profound insight here. So he says, in other words, where if the first object had not been, the second never had existed. So that looks like a different statement. Uh, and I don't want to discuss it in detail, but the crucial thing is that this is a, some kind of uh, conjunctive or, or, or an irrealis. So it's something about something that has not happened, but you speculate uh, uh, whether it could have happened or something like that. Yeah? So that's a very strange statement. 
And, uh, and this also comes up in practical statistical problems. And uh, it came up, for instance, here in uh, Neyman. Um, not sure how to pronounce the first name. Is it Jerzy or Jerzy? Do we have someone Polish in the audience? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you read the first name to us? Uh, Jerzy. Jerzy, okay. So this guy... Um, was considering an interesting uh, real practical application. He said, let's assume we have m plots of land and we have a number of varieties of crop and we want to find out which one is the best for our land or the best in some sense. Now we can do experiments and plant a variety on crop of crop on each piece of land, uh, but we can only plant uh, uh, one variety per season and maybe the next season is already different and something fundamentally changes, etc. Et so really, what we would like to have is this variable, which would should be the crop yield that we would observe if a variety I were planted on plot J. So that's a whole matrix, uh, nu by m. Unfortunately, uh, uh, for each uh, plot J, we can only determine one of the entries. So it's a matrix that's very sparsely populated. Uh, all the other entries we cannot observe and we call them counterfactuals. So these are just quantities that we would have observed if we had planted something there. Um, so it, it's actually, even though it sounded like a philosophical issue, it's quite a practical question. Um, and, uh, and some people, so in some sense this is the starting point of a, another approach for causality, uh, which was popularized by uh, Rubin in Harvard. Uh, it's called the Potential Outcomes Framework, and they basically say that causality is a missing data problem. So, uh, inspired by this uh, 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 problem here of Neyman, as there's a complicated discussion between uh, this field and the Judea-Pearl approach, and uh, people don't quite agree what is a special case of what, etc. And, uh, and we're not going to go in detail on this one, um, mainly because we don't know it so well, and the Judea-Pearl approach somehow seems seems to be closer to machine learning, and uh, it's a very nice approach, let's put it this way. It's nice to learn about it. Uh, I also, I shouldn't say the Judea-Pearl approach because it was built by a number of people, as I mentioned before. Um, okay, so uh, one more thing about interventions. So uh, uh, one thing to specify here is, I, I wrote these equations like this before, uh, with the equality, uh, but it's a little bit tricky to think of it just as a mathematical equality. You should think of it more as a, an equality if you program in certain computer languages where you can write i equal i plus one. <coughs> so it's an assignment. Um, so for instance, you couldn't, what you could, can't do is uh, modify the value of xi and then compute. So for instance, suppose you could invert this function uh, you're not allowed to then uh, change the value of xi and compute what the new values of the parents should be or something like that. So you, in some sense, this equation, you cannot solve it for other variables and then try to predict what happens to these other variables if I change something here. So you can only, you can change those guys and see what happens to this one, or you can change this one and see what happens downstream to the next one. So this is the kind of intervention that are allowed. So it's a strange kind of equality. It's an equality uh, that looks like a normal mathematical equality, but it doesn't allow everything that you could normally do in mathematics in some sense. Okay, so, and this is actually also conceptually a very difficult issue. You can just uh, leave it at that and believe it, or you can try to understand it from a different point of view. And um, I think it's fairly open. Uh, we, we tried to do some work recently um, trying to relate this to uh, uh, underlying sets of differential equations. So in, I mean in physics, you don't start with structural equation models, but you usually have some dynamics. You might be surprised I haven't talked about time so far. So in physics, usually uh, you have sets of differential equations, and a differential equation, of course, has a clear causal interpretation. A differential equation tells you exactly uh, that well, if you write it in terms of derivatives, uh, it, it tells you something about the derivative of one variable as a function of some other variables. But really, uh, uh, what it means is it tells you something about the difference between the next value of your variable in an infinitesimal, infinitesimally, well, you know what I mean, in a very close, <laughs> in a very close point in the future. So it tells you, I have this variable, I want to know what's going to be its value 
uh, in the very near future, depending on all these other variables. So that's a causal. There's a causal direction clear, uh, uh, clearly implied in here. But then you can ask the question: How can I get from such a set of, equ of equations to a set of structural equations, and ideally a set of structural equations where I know uh, on, uh, sort of uh, what this equality sign means, where I know on which side can I intervene and what changes if I change something else? And uh, <coughs> one way to do this with strong assumptions is to study uh, um, uh, equilibrium states of coupled sets of equations. And if you're interested in this. Um, you can look at this paper, which was published in UAI this year. So I think at this point, I'd like to introduce my co-speaker, uh, Dominic. And, uh, we should. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Um, the question what causality really means uh, is maybe an important one and Bernhard already mentioned it a bit but uh, of course it's uh, often the first thing we are asked and um, assume all our causal inference algorithms would be perfect and the output would be some DAG and we, we would have the, the joint distribution already then the question occurs, what does this DAG really mean? And um, one person who really uh, did big progress in formalizing what it is supposed to mean was Pearl. And he introduced the so-called uh, so do calculus. Um, I'm a bit DLCV. Okay, here is the. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so the motivation is um, causality is supposed to formalize the effect of interventions. So what happened with the other variables if you set one variable to a certain value? For instance, what happens with x, with y, if you set x to a certain value? And this is not to be confused with um, what happens with x, with y, if you just observe that x has a certain value. And uh, Pearl described how this distribution can be computed from the DAG and from the joint distribution together. So, um, given the joint distribution, and then you start with the causal factorization. Um, okay, here is the causal factorization. Bernhard has already been talking about that one. So, um, I shouldn't use this. <laughs> um, so, the causal factorization writes every... Um, the joint distribution is a product of the conditional distribution of every variable given its parents, so its direct causes. And uh, this uh, factorization is important because it describes the mechanisms. And uh, Pearl's idea is that if you do an intervention on one variable, then you would replace the corresponding conditional by this Kronecker symbol, like, pre prefer to do it this way, like the delta symbol. So you set the variable capital Xi to the value lowercase Xi and this means that we will replace the corresponding conditional with the Kronecker symbol. And this is the joint distribution that you obtain. And <coughs> in order to do, uh, to compute the effect on the remaining variables, you should replace, um, you end up with an expression that keeps all the conditionals except for the one you have intervened on and replaces the corresponding values of the parents with the value you have been uh, you have been assigned you have uh, assigned to um, then you obtain this uh, conditional distribution of xk do xi just by marginalization and to show 
that this is not the same as the usual conditional, we first look at the, the cases where it's the same. Um, we have these three DAGs where, for instance, X causes Y, and um, X causes Y, and in, in addition there is also a cause Z, or X causes Y directly, and in the addition it also causes it indirectly. But for all these cases, um, P of Y do X is the same as P of Y given X. Here is a case where it's not the same, because if Y causes X and you intervene on X, then this does not change the distribution of Y. The distribution of Y just stays the same. Um, if you have a common cause that causes X and Y and you intervene on X, this would not change the distribution of Y either. So these are the so-called, in a way, trivial cases. But the interesting ones are those where you have to control for confounding. Let's say X causes Y, and in addition there is a common cause Z that uh, causes both. Then you want to compute what happens if you intervene on X, how the distribution of Y changes. You start with the causal factorization, that's what you find here. Um, you replace the conditional X given Z with the corresponding chronicle symbol, that's what you do here. Then you marginalize and obtain this expression. And here you already see the difference to the conditional P of Y given X, because here you insert P of Z instead of P of Z given X. So um, this also makes it clear that whenever X and Z are independent, then both of them are the same. But since they are not independent because Z influences X, they are not the same. And the difference is exactly because you have to control for the confounder. Um, Pearl and his co-worker, co-workers, um, have done a lot of work on identifiability of uh, causal effects. Uh, what they mean by that is the following problem. Um, if you are given the causal DAG, and for instance you consider two nodes, I think they also consider more general cases, but uh, this is sufficient for the moment, then they ask which nodes need to be observed to compute this do probability, P of xi given do xj. If you um, recall this example, then here it's obvious in order to compute P of y do x, you need to observe all three variables. Uh, but for a general DAG, it's much more, much more sophisticated. If you have a general network, then uh, it's a really non-trivial question which ones you need to observe and which ones you need not. <coughs> okay, but um, this was only about what causality means in the end or how we would use it if we have inferred the DAG. Uh, the crucial problem for us is the problem of inferring the DAG and the key postulate is the causal Markov condition of which Bernhard has already mentioned the different formulations. Um, the essential mathematical concept is the deseparation. So deseparation describes the conditional independences that are required by the causal DAG. And uh, you can find these conditions, for instance, in Pearl's, Pearl's book. So, a path is said to be blocked. So, um, a path here is just a sequence of pairwise distinct nodes where consecutive ones are adjacent. And the path is said to be blocked by the set Z if uh, it contains a chain like I, M, J or a fork 
like a common cause, M influences I and J, such that the middle node is in Z, or the path Q contains a collider, like two variables I, J influencing M, such that the middle node is not in Z, and such that no descendant of M is in Z. We will come to this later. I think it's easier to, to understand it by looking at the examples. Um, then Z is said to deseparate X and Y in the deck G if Z blocks every path from a node in X to a node in Y. So the notion of uh, blocking path has been invented to formalize which path really uh, cause a dependence between variables or set its variables and which don't. So you can easily imagine that if you have two variables and they have a common effect, then this common effect would not generate a dependences, the, a dependence unless, and that's what I'm going to tell you later. Um, okay, here um, that's a simple example. So X influences Y via such a chain, if you condition on Z or condition on U or condition on both, then X and Y become independent because this conditioning blocks the path. This is the term terminology. But there's also a somewhat opposite example where X and Y by a, are connected by a path that is a priori blocked because they are just connected via this collider. So Z is called a collider because it's just an effect of U and X. But although this path is a priori blocked, you can open it by conditioning on W or conditioning on Z or conditioning on both. And this is an uh, effect that is sometimes also called a paradox. Um, the phenomenon of unblocking by conditioning on common effects. It's also called Bergson's paradox. Uh, here I have it for a very simple example, three binary variables, X and Y. Um, you assume that they are uncorrelated a priori, and then you set Z to one if and only if X or Y is set to one. For instance, assume for politicians there is no correlation between being a good speaker and being intelligent. And then you assume that a politician is successful if he or she is a good speaker or intelligent. Then among the successful politicians, being intelligent is negatively correlated with being a good speaker because the successful ones, you know, either intelligent or being a good speaker. So if someone is not intelligent, he or she must be a good speaker. So it, uh, it's an interesting question whether uh, a priori skills um, are negatively correlated or whether the common stereotype of negatively correlated uh, skills just are due to the fact that people focus on the selection of people um, who are skillful in some regard. Yes, that was the assumption, like uh, corresponding to this deck, X and Y are independent. This is, uh, of course, just a toy example, yeah. Okay, but then, then uh, everything can happen. Then conditioning. Ah, okay. So the, the question was what happens if X and Y are a priori dependent already? Um, then uh, it's, it's hard to say then conditioning on that could uh, cause an additional dependence or it could weaken depend the dependence. That's very different. Yeah. Okay. And uh, here we have a nice asymmetry under inverting errors. So if X and Y have a common effect Z, then they are a priori independent, but conditioning on Z on the common effect makes them dependent. 
On the other hand, if Z is a common cause of X and Y, then they are a priori dependent, but conditioning on the common cause makes them independent. Um, another example of deseparation that shows that uh, you need to condition onto the, on the right set of variables. Um, here you have, for instance, a collider at V. So you can block the two paths by conditioning on Z and v W. You can condition on Z, U and W. You can condition on v, v, Z, U, W. But if you condition on V, Z and U, then they are dependent. Okay, um, we are uh, the the question that often occurs: how a causal inference is um, related related to time ordering. Of course, if you have two variables x and y, and you observe a dependence, then uh, you know due to Reichenbach's principle that either x influences y or y influences x, or there is a common cause of both. If x happens earlier than y, or is measured earlier than y, then we know that x can only cause y, or there is a common cause of both. But still, although uh, we can exclude one of the three options, it's still a hard problem to distinguish between these cases. For instance, if the barometer falls before it rains, it does not mean that it, that it causes the rain. The conclusion is that time order makes causal problems slightly easier, but does not solve it. Um, it however, it can solve it almost under some circumstances. Um, I was mentioning this uh, common cause problem, but if you assume that you have a set of variables that is causally sufficient, so we call a set of variables causally sufficient, if there is no common cause that is unobserved. So you can drop variables that influence only one of the observed one, but you cannot drop variables that influence two or more variables. Okay, so a given a set of variables that are time-ordered and causally sufficient, then you can do causal inference in the following way then you just start with the complete DAG that corresponds to this order. And you just need to remove parents because you already have the set of possible parents and you just need to remove the ones that don't have an influence. But this can be done already by statistical testing because the um, a variable in this set of possible parents can be removed if it's independent of the variable under consideration given the remaining parents. So going from potential errors to true errors only requires statistical testing, but the only is, of course, in big quotation marks. It's an infinite data phenomenon, phenomenon where you can really do that. Okay, but we have seen that if you have time order and if the variables are causally sufficient, then in a sense causal inference reduces to independence testing. And the very popular method that uses this fact is Granger causality. So here you see a typical interaction between time series. You have these values x and the values y. So Y influences its own um, future and it potentially influences the future of X. X influences its own future and it potentially influences the future of Y. Here we have excluded instantaneous effects and we have excluded common causes. Then you can infer that whenever the present of y is independent of the past of x, 
given the past of y, then there must be an error from x to y or several errors. Otherwise, deseparation would tell you that they need to be independent. And this is the idea that um, Granger was using. Um, he phrased it uh, mostly in terms of linear prediction. He said, whenever the past of x helps when predicting y, t from its past, then there must be a causal influence. And uh, it has become rather popular to measure this strength of the causal influence by the transfer entropy. And the transfer entropy just considers this strength of conditional dependence as a measure for causal strength. So it's the conditional mutual information of the present of y and the past of x given the past of y. Um, okay, so uh, qu qualitatively this is a reasonable idea because we have seen that deseparation implies that whenever this quantity is non-zero there need to be errors. So it's tempting to take this quantity as a measure of the influence because it's um, it's, it's a witness of causal influence. Um, but there are, however, several problems. One issue is the uh, confounding problem um, that I already mentioned. If there is a hidden common cause set, so let's say there's just a third time series that influences x and y, and for simplicity it's memoryless in this case, um, because then uh, the, uh, the effect is easier to understand, then one can show that if z influences the next value of x and the second next value of y, then this causes a time delay in the de between the dependencies of x and y that pretends an error from x to y, because due to this time t delay, the past of x would tell you something about the present of y, even if you know the past of y. And a Granger causality would here in this example infer that x causes y and y does not cause x. But um, even if you exclude confounding, confounding these common causes, then there is still another issue pointed out by I. Polani, Ian Polani. Um, I mean, this is a toy example, but, but it nicely shows something, nevertheless. Um, assume you have y that influences the, the next x value deterministically, and x in turn influences the next y value deterministically. So this is, these are just copy operations. And I think in this example we would agree that the causal influence is strong because if you think in terms of interventions, that if you intervene on an x value, if you change it, then this change is copied to the y value, to the next y value, so there is a strong influence. But Nevertheless, uh, this transfer entropy is zero because the past of y already determines its present. So it's a bit like um, if I forget my own opinion from 20 years ago and I have a good friend um, who tells me my opinion and then I'm, I change my opinion again because I recall that was my old op opinion then in a way I'm still influenced by my friend. And um, if, you, if you tell people this example, then um, they sometimes argue, well, this is not realistic because uh, it involves a perfect copy operation for the entire argument. Um, this is right, but um, still you can easily uh, introduce small errors, so if you introduce a small error for every copy operation, then uh, you can easily check that this transfer entropy will be small 
it's of course not zero, so it's still um, it's useful as a witness of the causal influence, but it doesn't quantify it properly. So uh, it's still conceptually the wrong thing to do. And Yes, for Granger causality, the same apply, argument applies to. I mean, uh, Granger causality is just usually understood in the sense of, sense of linear prediction, but it's uh, exactly the same kind of idea. The past, it just quantifies how much the past of X tells about the present Y, given the past of Y. And because the past of Y already tells me everything about the present Y, uh, it's uh, not going better. Okay, so therefore we have thought we need another way to quantify causal strength. And uh, to this end we assume for the moment that um, we perfectly know the causal DAG and we perfectly know the joint distribution. And uh, we are given a causally sufficient set of variables. So everything is nice. And still, the, the problem of quantifying causal inference is difficult. So, for instance, we want to quantify the strength of this red error. Then we, we said we, we postulate some properties uh, that we would like our measure to have. One property that we found nice... Oh, here is some typographic issue. Mm -hmm. it, it's on my slide, definitely. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Until... Mm, where is the joint? Ah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so... For this sample, simple DAG, we postulate that the strength of X causes Y is just the Shannon mutual information between X and Y. And it's not that we say this is the only way to quantify it, but it seems reasonable because all the dependencies are due to the error from X to Y. We say the strength of the dependence is the strength of the causality. But it's only on the on this single slide, right? Yeah. Okay. Then yeah, okay. Unless it occurs a second time. Okay. Then another postulate which uh, which seems pretty obvious if you apply this to to real data. I mean, um, if x is caused by some other variable and if y have, has some other effect, then yeah. Uh, it's IID data, so I'm not talking about time series at the moment. Okay, so here we would stay, uh, still say the mutual information between X and Y is the quantity we want to have. Um, and then, okay, this is a bit less obvious, uh, but we still think it's a reasonable postulate. It says that the th strength maturizes the conditional dependence given the other parents. And the idea is Without this red arrow, the conditional dependence between X and Y given Z would be zero. So because this quantity is only non-zero due to the error, of course, uh, we, we should say that the strength of the error is at least as strong as this dependence. Um, okay, but uh, if you look at this the example, then it's also tempting to take, yeah? Yeah. No, but that's why your condition on it. Yeah. Um, okay, Craig said uh, you also have a 
confounder, so the dependence could be to due to the confounder, but uh, only the marginal dependence is due to the confounder. The conditional dependence is not by the confounder. Um, okay, so uh, if you are aware of this fact, then it's tempting to consider this conditional dependence already as a good measure for causal inference, but um, there's a simple argument why this doesn't make sense. Um, consider this confounded deck again and assume you weaken the influence of Z on Y um, to, uh, to such an extent that it completely disappears. Then you have this deck. But for the right deck, we have already said, we have already postulated that the mutual information, the unconditional mutual information would be the right measure. So this contradicts it. This shows that uh, quantifying the causal influence in this case is already challenging. Our approach works with an operation that we called edge deletion. Um, the intuition is the following. If you think of the variables as devices and think of the edges as electric wires connecting them, then uh, our edge deletion operation is means uh, cutting the wire and feeding the open end with an IID copy of the source. And formally what you get is the um, the distribution on the top. So here you see this P of X prime. And then uh, causal strength, our measure of causal strength quantifies the impact of edge deletion. So it just computes the relative entropy distance between the original distribution and the one where you have deleted the edge. Mm -hmm. And this satisfies all our postulates. And um, it we think that it defines a nice uh, measure and also it's also more general, it's also uh, defined for set of edges and therefore it can also apply to time series. And we think that this is conceptually a more cleaner way to, to quantify causality in time series than Granger causality in transfer entropy. Uh, the relevance uh, of this um, difference still needs to be explored. Okay, but um, I think our main topic is inferring the DAG without time information and um, we are given IID data sampled uh, from a joint distribution of n variables and the goal is to infer the DAG. The key postulates are con the causal Markov condition and causal faithfulness. Causal faithfulness um, has mainly been postulated by these three guys, uh, philosophy professors in Pittsburgh. Um, causal faithfulness says that only those independences hold true that are implied by the Markov condition. So we only have conditional independence when there is deseparation. Or in other words, every dependence that is allowed by the DAG structure is also observed. That's the postulate. Um, to motivate that, um, the following example shows a bit why this seems reasonable to as assume. Um, assume, for instance, you have a linear network, a linear relation between variables. So X influences Y indirectly, uh, no, X influences Z directly and also indirectly via Y. And uh, observe for this DAG, you would have X independent Z. Of course, this can be the case. But here this would mean that the direct influence and the indirect influence compensate each other exactly. And if you um, look at the, at the linear parameters, then you can easily show that this only holds if 
the linear parameters uh, are chosen in a particular way. For instance, here, no, not for instance, that's exactly the condition. If beta plus alpha times gamma are zero, then this path and this path would cancel. Another, another nice example is uh, with binary variables. So let's say you have x and y are fair coins and z is the x or of x and y. Uh, many of our counter examples are with the x or. It's a nice example. Um, if you, okay, so with these assignments of the distribution, you can easily see that x and z and x and, and y and z are independent but of course this is an independence that is not required by the DAG structure so this is a violation of faithfulness but uh, you can also see easily that um, if you change the distributions p of x and p of y to non-uniform distributions then you get a dependence so every, this, uh, every such violations of faithfulness would disappear if you change parameters slightly. And so the uh, conditional independence-based causal inference, um, mainly done by this uh, Pittsburgh group and by Perl, uh, uses causal Markov condition and causal faithfulness as its two cornerstones. So they except only those DAGs as causal hypothesis for which conditional dependence and deseparation coincides. And uh, this identifies causal DAGs up to Markov equivalence classes. So Markov equivalence classes are the class of DAGs that imply the same conditional independences. And this class can be characterized in a quite explicit way um, by the following theorem two DAGs are Markov equivalent if they have the same skeleton and the same V structures. And the skeleton is the corresponding undirected graph and the V structure is the substructure where you have such a collider, two variables influencing one in the middle, but the two causes are disconnected, they are not directly linked. No edge between them. Um, simple examples of Markov equivalent legs. legs. I equivalence. Ah, okay. Uh, con um, independence con uh, equivalence in the context of directed graphs. Should be the same. Um, I'm not used to, to this term. Um, okay, so this is a simple example. You have either a uh, causal chain, x causes y causes z, or a causal chain in the other direction, or a common cause, y causes x and z. And for all these three DAGs, you have x causes z given y as the only conditional independence. A um, bit more sophisticated example, these two DAGs coincide up to the direction of the red arrow. So they also have the same skeleton, the same undirected graph, and the same V structure at W. Um, okay, so this was the, cause, the uh, Markov equivalence. They are, they are indistinguishable by the independence-based algorithms. So we will later talk about how to distinguish causal structures within the same e equivalence class. That's uh, one of our main research. Um, okay, and uh, fortunately this uh, construction of causal hypothesis can be done in an algorithmic way. I first start with the IC algorithm uh, as uh, described by Verma and Perl. Uh, the idea is first construct the skeleton, then find the V structures 
And then direct further edges that follow from the fact that the graph needs need to be acyclic and the fact that all these structures have been found in step two. Um, to construct the skeleton, uh, you need to be aware of the following theorem. Um, X and Y are linked by an edge if and only if there is no set SXY that renders them conditionally independent, assuming Markov condition and faithfulness. And the explanation is that every dependence that would be mediated by other variables can be screened off by conditioning on an appropriate set. Uh, I'm emphasizing appropriate because of the following reason. We have seen that conditioning on con common effects generates dependencies. So if you want to make X and Y independent, you need to condition on Z and W, but you're not allowed to condition on U. This is, by the way, uh, an important difference to undirected uh, graphical models. In um, so the, the skeleton I'm talking about should not be confused with undirected graphical models. Here the skeleton is just obtained by removing the directions from the errors. Uh, but this is how we start with in causal inference. Then this set uh, given by W and Z is called the subset for XY. Um, and Spurtis and Gleimer have found um, an efficient construction of the skeleton. I will say in which way it is uh, efficient later. Um, it's basically an iteration over the size of this separating set. So you start with a complete, uh, fully connected, undirected graph, and then you remove all edges for variables that are marginally independent. So just disconnect X and Y if they are independent. Then in this is the, or well, let's call it first step. Then in the second step, you remove all edges for which there is a neighbor set that makes X and Y independent. And then you go further with um, remove all edges for which there are two neighbors that make them conditionally independent. And in this procedure, you already drop a lot of edges, hopefully, unless uh, the, the, the deck you want to find is uh, uh, strongly connected. So assuming some kind of sparsity in the true deck, you then find efficiently the skeleton. Um, so the advantage of this procedure is that um, many edges can be removed already for small sets, and this is also important for statistical reason. If you Im imagine how difficult it is to condition on a large set of variables, because um, if you condition on a variable that takes 10 values, then you already def divide your data set into 10 in a way, because you need to split it up into the values, unless you have a very clever way of doing conditional independence testing. Bernard will be talking about that later. Okay, so um, this yields a, an algorithm that is polynomial for graph of bounded degree. Um, and I think I will try to finish this. Okay, so uh, this was uh, finding the adjacencies. Now the um, an important step is how to direct edges. You want uh, to find the V structures. So the V structures are again these colliders um, that um, with disconnected parents. Um, so you search over all triples x, y, z, for which, oh, this is a typo, x and z, the z should be in the middle, sorry about that, uh, for which x and y are non-adjacent, and then um, because they are non-adjacent, you know that there's a separating set that renders them conditionally independent, 
then a priori we would have four possible orientations for the two edges we are talking about. Um, either these causal chains or the common cause. But there's only one orientation for which Z is not an element in the separating set. So you check whether this separating set contains the variable Z, and if this is not the case, you orient the errors into a V-structure, into this unshielded collider. I think we could stop here and discuss the example later. Uh, well, these are lots, lots. Yeah, we should stop here, I think. Yeah.